Hello, everyone. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, if you have an empty seat next to you, can you please raise your hand? Okay, people in the aisles, look who's raising their hands and move towards that seat. Uh, whatever you do, please don't block the entrance or the aisles. Thank you. So that was not a random person. That was Vasilis, who's been UGSI for this forever. All right. Uh, if you have a seat next to you, please keep your hand up so that people can see. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, please, we have people standing, so if you could please, if you have a backpack on a seat, if you could please take it off. Thank you. And raise your hand so that they can see that there's a seat next to you. All right, right there, up front. There. Right here. All right, everyone. There's something I need you to do. Um, and this is going to be something that I'd like you to do every day as you come into the room. Uh, this is an auditorium, uh, and so, you know, people can buy tickets for it. Seats are numbered. What I would like you to do is if you are seated in a seat, and if you are not, I apologize, just listen. Um, if you're seated in a seat, just look at the seat that you're sitting in, fr in, in the front of the seat is a number, a seat number. Yes? You know where to find your seat number? All right, settle down. Wait, 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 wait. Clearly, every seat, this is an, a grid, so every seat has two attributes. It has a number and it has a row number. It is not so easy for people sitting in the middle of the row to know which row they're in. Therefore, the people in the aisles, could you please look at your... Uh... There you go. Look at the seat. You see a row label. That's a letter. All right, Chinese whispers now pass this down. 
And I apologize to any Chinese who don't know what that means. This, this is a game that little children play where you say a word and you keep whispering it down a row. All right. Could you please raise your hand if you do not know what your row number or your seat number is? No embarrassment. This is the first time. Okay. Could you find your row number, please? Okay. So ask the people behind you and in front of you and then maybe make an inference. missing. (laughs) Yes, that's J. Uh, Ask the people on that side. Okay, they'll sort it out. We have the mystery of a missing letter. That's okay. Today we're spending some time on this. Obviously, in future, we are not going to do this. When you come into a row, look, you're coming in from an aisle, look at the letter. All clear? Please, you're going to need this. Thank you. All right, thank you all for coming out in full force. I'm very happy to see you. Um, Today's lecture is on data types, and let me explain what that means sort of rather informally. You've seen that we've worked with numbers, so when you do 2 plus 3, you just type in 2 plus 3 and out pops 5. But when you type in Stephen Curry, then you put it in quotes, and so you didn't put the number in quotes, and it's, we kind of did, it, did stuff on the fly, but it's a good idea to have some kind of organization of what all these different things are, when you use this and when you can, cannot use that, and so on and so forth. So today's lecture is going to feel a bit like a laundry list. Right? Lots of small observations about this type, that type, what you can do, what you can't do. None of it is very involved or complex, But all of it is good to have written down somewhere or to know that it's in your textbook somewhere so that you can refer to it. If you get an error message, then there's a way of going back and saying, wait a minute, what was that? So again, you should not try to, you should not feel that you have to have all this memorized when you leave. We just go through the sequence, you ask your questions, and then when you are coding, you have this open in front of you or the relevant textbook sections or the lab or something, and then you'll be fine. Uh, so the examples today are going to be very small and rather straightforward, and you're going to say, wait a minute, I don't need a computer for this, and you'll be absolutely right. You don't need a computer for what we're going to do today, but today we are going to set up the structure so that when you come back on Friday, we can go deeply into tables and do some quite substantial calculations. So today is just sort of a getting-to-know-you session with Python um, to get us set up for what we actually want to do. Um, And so, as always, announcements, there aren't many. Homework one is due tomorrow. You know that. You get an extra point if you turn it in today. Uh, I'd like to take you attendance credit starts this week, though, honestly, if it's as full as this, um, that's wonderful. We don't actually have to do anything about the credit. Um, There is a mandatory welcome survey as part of Homework 1. That is, it is a question on the homework, so please fill it out. It helps us know who you are and therefore helps us tailor the course, if necessary, uh, to the to the group. Um, I do want to take you through. There is a lab that is currently that has currently been released, and labs start this afternoon. Yes. So I'd just like to be clear about that. Policy, if I could ever get on the policy space. Okay, look. The expectation about lab is that you will do the lab in lab. 
It's been released early. That's fine. The expectation is that you will go to lab, you will talk to your friends, you will talk to your GSI and so on, and then you will do the lab. Some people like to get started early. And some people sometimes can just finish it entirely themselves. Oh, look, I have a page. Labs. So there are two ways to get credit for lab. The first way is what we typically expect. That is, you will attend lab, you will make a substantial effort on the lab, and the GSI will say, okay, you're pretty much done with this lab, and they will check you off. That's the main way to get credit. Some people like to do lab independently, and that's fine. You can do it independently, but then you have to start when it's released and do it before the lab starts completely correctly. If you can do that, fine. You can get credit that way as well. And if you are confused about that, will you please go to lab today and just nail this down with your GSI? Right? But our typical expectation is that you will go to lab and work together. That is why in lab, we're, since you're going to be there, we take it as an opportunity to give you some practice in uh, um, aspects of the course that aren't purely computational. Uh, so, for example, there is a discussion worksheet, and you will go through problems uh, or some exercises uh, in the aspects that aren't computational. Right now, of course, we are just focused on computation, so uh, there may not be a discussion worksheet, but almost every lab will have one. Um, okay. Admin questions not to do with enrollment. Cal Central is trying to manage a massive, great project, and it's not always very comprehensible what's going on, but people are managing to get themselves in one way or another. Yes? Uh, is there a portal where you can track your progress? That's done in OKPy. OK Please ask your GSI, and they will be able to tell you exactly what you should do. And since you've asked that question, I'll ask the GSIs to make a post on Piazza. So yes, this time we arranged, uh, based on student requests from last term, that there should be such a thing. Thank you for asking that, yes. Is there any way to check that you got full points on the homework? Yes, when it comes back to you graded. <laughs> and it's, it's a traditional way. There's no, I mean, you have to turn in homework in this, you know, uh, not on paper, but the grading is done partly by machine and partly by human readers because we're asking you to actually write paragraphs. More questions? Yes? I'm sorry? Is there no, no new lab on the calendar? I'm seeing questions on Piazza. There is. So check, just refresh the screen maybe. All right. What I would like to do today is uh, first find my slides. There we go. All right. Um, so, you have to forgive me today, I'm not very well. And when I'm not very well, you know, I'm trying to do detailed things, stuff happens, you have to be prepared to say, Professor, what you just said, are you on Tylenol or something? Because that didn't make any sense. All right? And that's just fine, because I need that today. I need your help. Uh, and this kind of started on Monday, and I was thinking back to a moment where the entire class burst out laughing, and I want to make sure that I didn't cause confusion by not saying what I meant to say. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to do a review. Um, a very brief one-slide review. Okay. Uh, so there's our old friend Cones. That's a table. And you remember the method select and drop that create smaller tables out of that one. Yeah? Okay. So what I'd like to do is I would like you to pretend that each of those portions, x equals something, x, that is a cell of a notebook. And then the next cell is y equals something y, and then the next cell is x equals something x, and so on. Those are all cells, right? So uh, cells are separated by space. OK, so what I'd like you to do is each of those cells produces a table. What I'd like you to do is basically when I ask, please just sing out the labels of the columns of that table. Good? So the labels of cones are flavor, color, and price. Okay, x equals cones dot select something or other, x, and the column labels are flavor, comma, color. Okay, no big reveal there. It just says select those. Great. Y equals x dot drop color. The label in Y is flavor. Excellent. 
x equals cones dot select color price x color price yeah okay y Y. Column heading of Y. How many columns, by the way? One column? All right. So there's some one thing that you're going to spit back at me. How many people want to say color? Not many people want to say color. That makes sense. We've kind of dropped color. We think we've dropped color. All right? Okay, so now the battle is between flavor and price. Which is it? Votes for flavor? Votes for price? Some, okay, so this, this is an issue that does need to be addressed. And what we're going to do is we're going to run the cell, um, and we're going to see what happens. Um, so let me find my notebook. There's my notebook. Today I'm going to start showing you gum on top. At the moment, it's just gum on top. Uh, later on, we'll go through the lines of the, the gum. Okay, so here's cones. Here's flavor and color. We all agreed on that. Here's why. It took X and it dropped color. And so it returned flavor. So here's an assignment to X. Yes, and it's this last one about which there was a little bit of doubt. So I'm going to run this cell. Okay, so flavor wins. Right, and a lot of people said flavor, and I'm, I'm glad you, you said that. It's, it's important to see what happened here. And this was a point of confusion last time as well, so let's get down. It has to do with what's assigned to the name. So we define y here. y was based on this x. What was this x? That was this guy. When you drop color from this one, you have the flavor column only. Agreed? Then we redefined x. But we did not redefine y. So this is the old y. Uh, it, the, uh, we have not gone back and recalculated y based on your new x. Right, so it's just progressing uh, sequentially down, and that's why this is flavor. So try to just keep moving down your notebook. Copy stuff over and recalculate if you need to, but going back and expecting that things will change doesn't work. And you know, every system has to make a choice how it deals with this, and that's the choice that was made. Okay, so what I'd like to do today is start with uh, the types of data. And the basic type that you work with a lot is numbers, and so you know that, um, um, oh, you've done plus, okay, so we've got 10, uh, you've seen this, okay. So if I just look at 5, that's a number, and it's called an int integer. And I took one int above that, and I multiplied it by another int, and I got another uh, integer 10. Um, if I take 10 and divide by 3, clearly that is not an integer. Um, and this thing is called a floating point number. Never mind why. It's just referred to as a float. Uh, it has to do with uh, how systems can decide on placing decimal points, and if you're interested in those details, I highly recommend the CS61 series. Okay, um, so you've got a int, integers and floats that are numbers that have decimal points, basically. Stuff off the decimal. I'd like you to notice something. If I do 10 divided by 2, that should be 5, right? Just an integer, except division gives you a float, because it's just preparing itself for the fact that it may have decimals, yes. Um, why is the output of number 13 3.3 Very good observation. Okay, so 10 divided by 3 should be 3.3333333, and lo and behold, there's a 5. Yes, that's odd. That is distinctly odd. Hold that thought. We're coming to it in a minute. Good observation, good eyes. Okay, so... There's the question of how big your numbers can be. 
After all, there is a limited amount of space in a machine, even the biggest machine. So there are limits to how big numbers can be. Integers, ints, can be very, very large. So how about we do, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven... Why don't I raise that to the power 890? Shall we try that? Big number or small number? Big number. Let's see. Ready? Go. That is a number. This here is the units place, the tens place, the thousands place, the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, etc., etc. And up here is the gazillions place. I don't know, even know how to count that. So integers, as you can see, can be massively large. Floats, however, um, have some limits. The limits don't really restrict us much. I'm just going to start one, two. Okay, I have to stop going crazy here. So, all right, so what is that? 27 decimal places I've given it. One through nine, I repeated three times. Okay, so if I just say, okay, what is that number? Look what happens. It just chops it off at some point. 15, 16, 17 out there somewhere. It just chops it off. It doesn't give me the rest. And basically, that's how much I'm going to get, and that's it. Very, very rarely... And never in this class are you going to be interested in numbers that are way out 15, 16 decimal places. Uh, as has been observed, they can be a little bit odd. Uh, let's just start seeing how numbers are represented. So if I take... Uh, 100 and divide by 400, that's a quarter, that's fine. Forty thousand. Okay, so far so good. And then, how about I just go a little crazy? And then you start to get scientific notation because it won't give you point zero 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 zero. It's very hard to keep track of how much that is. This means the minus says move the decimal point to the left, and the fifteen says move the decimal point to the left, fifteen by fifteen places. So point zero 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then two five. Okay. Um, so that is a representation, a compact representation of that number, and you just you have to know how to read it, but you're not going to be doing a whole lot with it. So as we saw, numbers sort of get chopped off at this point, and so what we're going to do now is we're going to see what happens when you do multiple operations on a number, and the first thing I want to do is I want to talk about a square root. You know that that's a power. Yep. What power is it? It's a half. So, for example, if I do 9 you get 3. Uh, if you combine an int and a float in an arithmetic operation, you're going to get back a float. Okay, so if I do so that's a, that's a whole number, but if I do the square root of 12, then that is not a whole number. It's something. Yep. Um, we can take a look at it. Three and a bit. Fine. If I take the square root of a number and then I square that thing, what should I get back? So I take the square root of 300 and then square that thing, what should I get back? 300, I should get that number back because I have taken one operation and uh, inverted it. So let's run this. I'm taking the square root of 12, and then I'm squaring that number. Look at that. This is because of that chopping off at the end and calculation issues. So you can see 11.9999999999, whatever, but not 12 cleanly. And that's the difference between mathematical, um, mathematics and computing. There are numerical accuracy issues. Now, of course, the accuracy issue is very minor. And you can see, weirdly, that there is an 8 at the end, and there's going to be stuff like that. And you just have to not worry about it. 
So for example, we are often going to do things like, you know, we create a set of proportions, and we need to check that they add up to one, so we add up all the proportions, and we get 1.000000, and right at the end, there's a four. That's fine. It's just one. Good? All right. Um, you can convert. So if I do 5, 4, 3, 2, point seven eight, you can convert this thing, well, to an int. And please observe what happened when you did that conversion. Notice the difference between this and rounding. It did not round. It chopped off. And you can take... Um, any integer, and you can convert to a float should you want to. It's possible. So you can go back and forth between types. All right. Um, let me just take you through Something you already know, you know all these different rules. The one you may want to take a look at is the remainder. When you divide 7 by 3, you get 2, and the remainder is 1. That line is there not because you're going to be taking remainders, but because you might want to use a percent, and I want to point out that the percent does something different in Python. Okay, so you actually have to compute the percent, and we'll do that later in, uh, uh, later in this lecture. Uh, demo, yeah, we kind of already have the demo. Uh, so ints and floats, this is a summary. You have two uh, n uh, number types on the real line. You've got an integer, any size. Float is a number with an optional fractional part. Decimal points, float always has one. Float uh, int doesn't. You might get scientific notations. Limitations, okay, on floats. Yes, there is a limit, but it needn't worry us. They have a precision of some number of decimal places. And after you do multiple lots of arithmetic, right? if your stuff is kind of off at the end of your number, then you use it. And then you use three other numbers that have stuff off. Then more and more stuff gets off. So after the first few decimal places, you should be a little uh, wary. The thing is, if you actually need accuracy out at the 10th, 11th decimal place, you would probably have changed your units, right? You would just have divided by 10 to the whatever. You would have changed your units so that you were looking at that place and it was not way out um, at the edges of your numbers. So this is, not, this is just something that you see so that when you observe, as the student just did, that there's a weird sort of five sitting somewhere. You know why that is. Okay. So here is a... If you, uh, a question for you to ponder with your, uh, with your neighbors. Uh, arithmetic has orders of operation. Okay. And the reason for this is to point out that those order matters and also to point out that powers, powers have pride of place. That happens early. And then products and then so on. So what you should do is to try to make a guess, talk to your neighbors, try to make a guess about what all these numbers are. What is going to happen? What's the actual calculation? You can write it out in math if you want, or you can just actually do the numerical calculation. Go. Try to figure out what these are, and then we'll see if we can order them.
All right, everyone. Uh, A. Big number or small number? Big number, because 10 to the 10 happens first. And that is a huge number, and that will get calculated. Um, and 10 to the 10 is 1 with 10 zeros, and then you'll get that times 3. Right? Huge number. Uh, next one. B, that number, what is, what is going to happen first? Excuse me, not paying tremendous attention. I seem to have got my microphone wire in a total twist here. Okay. All right, much better. So 3 to the power 10 is going to happen first, and 3 to the power 10 is some number. Uh, 3, then 3 squared is 9, then 3 uh, cubed is 27, and so on and so forth. And uh, so then that is going to be multiplied by 10. So 3 to the power 10 is smaller than 10 to the power 10. You agree? You don't actually need to compute it. Uh, and so even if you multiply that by 10, you're going to get a smaller number than A. Okay. Uh, and what is C? Can somebody describe C to me compactly? 30 to the power 10. Right? 30 to the power 10 is enormous because you've got the 10 times 3 in parentheses, so that's 30. That's going to be raised to the power 10. Okay. So 10 divided by 3 divided by 10. 10 divided by 3, what do you get? 3 and a bit. Yes? Divide that by 10, you get 0.3, small number. 10 divided by quantity 3 divided by 10. 3 divided by 10 is what? 0 0.3333, 3, just 0.3. 10 divided by a fraction. 10 divided by a fraction. Bigger than 10, smaller than 10. Bigger than 10. OK, you're in great shape. Excellent. Um, where am I? 7. OK. New type, strings. Strings are snippets of text, just text. And the string that we used last time, so every column label that you have has been a string. So Strings must be enclosed in quotes. You can use double quotes as well, and there is a place you, that's your choice. There is a certain kind of string for which you should use double quotes, and we'll do that in a minute. Um, so that's a string. That's another string. Spaces are fine, commas are fine, and so on. You can take a number and convert it to a string. Sometimes you know you have uh, categories of individuals, and you just cla you classify them, category one, two, three, four, those category labels are actually just labels. They aren't numbers. So you can take uh, um, the number two, and you can convert it to a string. And it will really help if this is a code cell. And you get the string two, and you can take the string two, and you can convert it to a back to a number. Um, let's see what happens if you try to do take the string 2.3 and make it an integer. There are a couple of reasonable choices. One is 2, yes? And the other is I don't know what on earth you're talking about. And let's see which one of those happens. I don't know what you're talking about happens. Okay, so basically it's not, what it's not doing is intuiting that you wanted to convert it to a float first and then convert to an integer. It's just saying, I can't do this. You can, however, do and that's just fine. Okay, uh, some things give all kinds of trouble. Don't do them. So if you say, well, I want two strings converted. Can you do it all at once, please? You get into trouble. Because it's sort of not exactly clear what that means. If you try to add apples and oranges, you get into trouble. Type error. Type error. You see that keep, keeps coming up? That means you're trying to do an operation that, takes, uh, that works on objects of certain types, and you're giving it different types, and it doesn't know what to do. Type error. All right, you can, however, do, you can add strings. The plus symbol in Python doesn't work only for numbers. You can actually do that. And what you get 
is the two strings right next to each other. No space. That's called a concatenation. And so, for example, uh, and if you want spaces, you have to put them in. Multiplication works too. How about this? Okay, so you can thank Python for having reduced the typing you have to do in your text messages. We just repeated the string five times and concatenated the five bits. Okay, so. That string, notice that I used double quotes. Why did I use double quotes there? Because a single quote is part of the string, and if I just use single quotes, and, uh, then we'd have had issues. So, yeah, it doesn't know what to do because it thinks the string has finished here. So if you have a single quote as part of your string, then use double quotes to delineate. OK, uh, very basic run through of strings. Questions? Again, I don't expect you to remember all of this. It's just there. And you can go look it up. If you have a type error, you should go back and say, wait a minute, we did this in class. So then go back and look and see what the issue is with the types. OK. Uh, you can actually, let me just see. We have a look. text of any length. So you've seen this. Here's the second. You see that the double quotes here because there is a single quote in the string. Uh, you can convert strings to numbers, and you can convert values to strings. You notice that in the slides, the demos always pop up after. I like to show the mechanics first and then do a summary. Um, and so I'll, I'll be going back and forth. We've, we've, we've done this demo. Um, so what I'd like you to do is I would like you to go through discussion question, talk to your neighbors, and figure out what is going to lead. All of these are going to give you errors. What's going to lead to the error in each case? Go. All right. X plus Y. What's the problem? Type error. Yes, thank you. X is an int, and Y is a string, and we just saw that you can't add those. Um, next one. X is an int, and we're adding int of something that looks good, except what's inside Y plus Z. What's Y plus Z? String plus string, that's OK. Yes? What's the string you're going to get? 45.6. Right? And if you try to convert that to integers, what's going to happen? It's not going to know what to do. Questions? Good so far? Yes? No. 
No, we went through that. Remember, we tried to do int of string 2.3, and it didn't know what to do. So it doesn't, it doesn't do the, two, the step that you aren't asking it to do. In your head, you're saying, well, first convert it to a float, and then give me an int. Right? It's not doing that. OK. Uh, and what's the problem with D? What's the problem with D? It's true x, y doesn't work. Right? So you need one out. Oh, great. OK, terrific. So you, uh, what you're doing is you're, trying, you're, you're learning how to debug your own code and just paying attention to a little bit of detail. All right. So these are the general note about types. Uh, we've seen five types so far. We've seen ints, floats, strings, functions, tables. There is a function. If you want to know what the type of something is, you can uh, call a function called type. I'll just show you what that is. So if you just do type of 2.3, then it tells you it's a float. And if you do type of 100, uh, you get ink. Um, let's try this, right? Uh, um, actually, no. let me just uh, select um, something arbitrary and then ask for the type of A. You get a float. What I want you to notice is that it's not telling you that the type of A is a name. It is evaluating A and telling you the type of that. OK. Um, so you can convert back and forth. You've seen you can convert things. OK, it's a really bad idea to type float of 1.2 in words. I have no idea why anybody would do that. Uh, but we're just telling you don't do stuff like that. I will say, though, You've got a notebook. Do it anyway. See what happens. You're going to get some blurt of an error message. Fine, OK. So then uh, you know that it doesn't work. If you wonder, will something work, just do it. OK, so we know how to convert, and we know how to convert back and forth. Uh, integer part of 1 point, uh, int, int of 1.2 will just give you the 1, so you've lost the point 0.2. And so you lose information. You should only do that if you absolutely need to, which actually I can't remember where you need to in this class. You might rarely. OK. Next thing is attendance, which we do not need. We will move right along. Look, it's an overfull class. Everybody's done. OK. You see what I mean by attendance not being a big deal? It's, it just works out just fine. OK. So that's a lot of time spent on single numbers and single strings. You know that we deal with large data sets, and we deal with columns of numbers. And so we want to deal with sets of numbers at once. And so we're going to deal with, we are now going to talk about sequences and a particular kind of sequence, which is an array. And to make an array, well, you just use make array if I do. I get that sequence 1, 2, 3, 4 in a type that is, uh, that is called an array. And you can give it a name. Or you can give an array a name. And you can ask to what is going on with my typing here. OK. You can look at it. And I wouldn't be worrying too much about all those different parentheses. It's just an array. Um, OK, so if I take, OK. So now, what is the point of these sequences? What I want you to have in your mind is a table. Every column of the table represents one particular attribute of your individuals. So imagine that there is a column. And the attribute is income. Do you remember our NBA table where we had a row per player? And the last column was the salary. 
So those were all numbers. And you might, you know, we did look at the largest salary. You might want to look at the average salary. You might want to look at the spread of the salaries. You want to work with just the salaries. A column is a sequence of uh, values of the same type. That's what an array is. An array is a sequence of values. They have to be the same type. You can't have one, two, cat, dog. Right? They all have to be the same type. And the reason we're doing this is because we want to use um, uh, operations on columns. Length. How long is an array? That has four elements in it. You can do, um, oh, I don't know. Um, That calculation is more commonly known as what? The average. Add up all the numbers and divide by however many there are. OK. Um, but the important thing about arrays is you can do operations. So this takes the entire array and does one operation on all of the numbers at once. Adds the whole lot up or counts how many there are in total or adds the whole lot up and then divides that number by something else and so on. The great thing about arrays is that you can do operations one element at a time in a very compact form. So let's remind ourselves of what my array is. And we can do, if I do my array times two, see what happens. Each element gets multiplied by two. Very, very handy. You create a new array in which the previous uh, array, every element of the previous has been multiplied by two. Um, OK, so just some other array. Uh, you notice that the length of another one is exactly the same as the length of my array. Yes, for each. And uh, all arrays here have numbers in them. If you have two arrays of the same size, you can do element-wise operations like this. Can somebody please tell me what has happened there? Term, so element by element, they've been added. So my array, the first element is 5. The second, uh, uh, another one, the first element is 20. So 20 plus 5 is 25. And then the 30 plus 6, and so on. So you can sort of, you're basically you're laying them side by side and you're adding up, yes? What happens if there are different number of elements? What happens if there are different numbers of elements in the two arrays? So how about, uh, uh, yes? Six, and now I try to do uh, my array plus yet another array, and it's not happy. It could not be broadcast together with these shapes. It does not know what to do. Yes? Yes, exactly. OK, so let me, I'm going to say, try to say your question back. Please correct me if I have not, I've not got it correctly. So I had taken my array, and I multiplied it by 2. And then I added my array to another one. And that multiplication by 2 is no longer in force. That's what you're noticing, yes? Yes, it's because I'm adding my array. And my array is still this. I did not redefine my array to be this one. This is a new array. I could give it a name. Yes? If at this point I had called it my array, then my array would have changed. But my array has not changed. All right. Uh, one of the things to note is that uh, arrays have items. So if I look at my array, how many items does it have? 
It has four items, and the natural thing to go do is say it's that's item one, two, three, four. But Python does not count like that. Python counts starting at zero. These items are zero, one, two, three. So, for example, the first element of your array is item zero. And so what's the last one in this case? It's item three. Okay, so all of Python counting is going to be like that. You can create a range like that. And actually, since people have decided the lecture is over, uh, why don't we declare this lecture to be over? Uh, on Friday, we will not waste time having you guys figure out which seat you're in. As you come in, please look at your row, and you can always figure out what your seat is. It's used for attendance. All right, have fun.